on his second journey, the Apostle Paul, he, he crossed the Aegean Sea and he landed here in this harbor. And as he lands, he's with uh, three other team members, uh, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Now, uh, today, this seaside town is Kavala, Greece. But, but in the first century, this busy harbor was called Neapolis. Now, uh, Paul and his team, they're headed inland about 10 miles to the city of Philippi, and there they're gonna find some phenomenal opportunity. But what interests me is not just what's in front of Paul, but what's behind him. You see, uh, over there across the Aegean Sea, he had experienced just some troubling challenges. There was a strained relationship with a beloved colleague and coworker. He had experienced some really tough miles. And, and then there was this issue of frustrating uncertainty, lack of clarity about what to do next and where to go next. And I'm guessing that those challenges are not unique to Paul that those are challenges that you may have experienced or maybe will experience sometime in your future. And so uh, today, on the first week of our series, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the challenges that Paul experienced and endured and overcame just to get this far. And as, uh, as we talk about his journey, it's gonna give us the opportunity to talk about ours and together to find strength for the journey. All right. I think it might be okay. The videos are good, the music's solid. Let's see how the sermons go. So glad you're here for week one of our fall series, Strength for the Journey. Those of you worshiping with us at uh, Kentwood uh, Campus and Nap Street, East Paris, I'm just so pleased that you're here today to join us as we begin this journey together. So let's start with this question. When is the last time, when is the last time you took a trip? You know, take a trip this summer of one sort or another? When is the last time you took a trip? Now, there's the easy, easy trips. These are what we call like a weekend getaway. Yeah, you go to Traverse City for a couple days. You go to Chicago for a couple days. I mean, it's a matter of uh, reserving a hotel room or maybe hooking up with an Airbnb. You know, we'll figure out what restaurants to go to once we get there. These are the weekend getaway types. And then there are the other types. Three friends decide to take six weeks in an uncle's... <clears throat> trusty old conversion van to do car camping of the national parks of the western states. Hey, what could go wrong? Six weeks, three friends, close quarters. And so uh, they take off from Michigan and they head uh, west and they want to go to the Badlands and then they want to do Yellowstone, Olympic Park up in Washington. They want to hit Yosemite in California and then go through uh, Arches National Park or Moab in Utah and then up to uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. What could possibly go wrong? Wrong. And then there's the breakdown of the trusty old van in Nebraska in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally, that's what the sign says. Middle of nowhere, Nebraska. Population nothing. Population gas station and overcharge repair shop. That's before they get to the Pacific Northwest and have rain, not just a drizzle, mind you, but constant rain. And then a little bit of a squabble when people are in way too close a quarters day after day after day. There's a mountain bike misadventure in Utah that requires an ER visit for some bruised ribs. Let's just understand something out of the gate. Uh, journeys can get complicated. Now that type, six weeks, three friends, car camping, this, my friends, is not a weekend getaway. Journeys can get complicated and sometimes confusing. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, we find these words. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas four words, they're critical words. Ready? Let us, let us go back 
and visit the believers in the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and let's see how they're doing. Paul and Barnabas, they're messengers. When that conversation takes place, it's about 50 AD. Now, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus sometime around 30 AD. So relatively speaking, Jesus' crucifixion was a current event. Most communities, most towns, most cities have never heard the news that the God of the universe took on human form. When he was suspended on a cross, he did that to pay off debts that weren't his. Debts that were ours. That when we couldn't reach up to God, God reached down to us in humility and in suffering. And these messengers, Paul and Barnabas, they travel with this news. It's good news. He says, believe that he did this for you and be willing to give your life to the God who gave his life for you. They're messengers of the news, but that one statement, let us go back, let us go back and visit those towns and see how those people are doing. I wonder if they have any clue that this will happen next, that there will be a journey that will require three years of their lives. 2,700 miles of walking and sailing over the course of about three years. What could possibly go wrong? And we get to travel with them over the course of six weeks. Over the course of six weeks, we get to journey with them through cities like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And we get to go to Athens and then to Corinth in southern Greece. And as we journey with them, we're going to ask the same question week after week after week. And it's just this. How in the world did they find strength for their journey? And how can you find strength for yours? Because you will be on one, you know. And maybe you're in one today. Dial into the voice of your Lord. Follow the, the nudges that he gives you. Guaranteed, you will find yourself in an unpredictable journey. It's the couple who says one day, why don't we consider adopting? Adopting. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of families at Ada Bible Church who have adopted a child. Question, any complications along the way? Any challenges in this journey of adoption? They've been going out for a long time. Finally comes the day, will you marry me? Yes. And they lived happily ever after. What could possibly go wrong? Listen, and they want to do this right, and they want to get this right, but they have just embarked on the journey of establishing family. It's the man or woman that receives yet another raise, and with that raise comes another uptick in lifestyle, and then another jump in income, and then another jump in lifestyle. And then another jump in income, and one day the question, is this it? Is this, is this the goal? I mean, is, is, is my life goal, is relationship to work and money, just to accumulate a pile of new and better stuff? They do not realize it, but that single question, is this it? Just a bigger mound of new and better stuff? Is this it that is gonna send them on a journey? It could send them on the journey of simplicity. It could send them on the journey of contentment. It could launch them on the journey of generosity, but they will find themselves on a journey. Let's just agree on something together. The journeys that we end up going on, we don't always get to choose. Someone hears the words, it's cancer. And they find themselves suddenly navigating the maze of treatment options. Employees are being called in one at a time and sat down. <laughs> we decided to outsource the IT department and suddenly you find yourself on the journey of the unemployed, the journey of seeking re-employment. Those who have heard the words, I don't love you anymore and I'm not sure that I ever did. And you find yourself suddenly on the road of the suddenly single. Or it's the routine pregnancy. 
then that ultrasound tells you that this is anything but a routine pregnancy. Let's just get this out of the way in week one. Many journeys are challenging. Many journeys are confusing. And the question before us today, for whatever journey you're on, is this. How can you find strength for this journey that happens to be your journey? Either a journey you're right in the middle of or one that's right around the corner. And so today, as we launch the series together, we just want to look at three challenges that Paul and his team experience. We're talking right out of the gate as their journey that we call the second missionary journey gets started. Three challenges, which I believe, I believe them to be common challenges in life, common challenges of those who embark on a journey. Now, if you, if you have your journal with you, snag one of these. By the way, you might want to write your name on the front somewhere. There are a couple of these that will be floating around. But if you could find pages, pages five and six, you have some of the text for today, but also where it says the row, just space to scribble. Listen, maybe draw, not to take dictation on the sermon, but maybe just to write down a couple things that you think need to stick with you as you move into your week. Take advantage of that today. Three challenges. I believe these are common challenges for those who embark on a journey. And challenge number one, challenge number one is uh, the challenge of conflict. Challenge of conflict. And by conflict, I mean interpersonal conflict. By conflict, I mean a strained relationship with someone that you care about. Challenge number one, the challenge of conflict. Now, uh, you'll notice the opening words that we read first, uh, Acts 15, 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, what were the four words? Let us go back, which indicates that there is some place that they had been before. Now, we're dialing in in this series on the second journey of Paul. And so when Paul says, let's just go back, this is a reference to the, this is not a trick question, this is a reference to the first journey that Paul and Barnabas embarked on. And so uh, Paul, it's, it's actually a team of three individuals that launches out. It's Paul and it's Barnabas and it's a guy by the name of John Mark. And they leave Antioch, uh, which is like 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Antioch is this sending epicenter for messengers of the Jesus movement, a real stable Jesus community there. And they send out Paul and Barnabas. John Mark goes with them. They travel, sail over to the island of Cyprus. They cross, they walk across the island of Cyprus. And then they sail uh, uh, up through the Mediterranean to a town called Perga. And something happens in Perga. What happens in Perga is that John Mark goes, I'm done. I'm done. John Mark bails on the group and suddenly your trio becomes a duet with Paul and Barnabas traveling on from there. But you need to know this, John Mark bails on the journey. He deserts them. Paul and Barnabas then travel from Perga up to Antioch. Now listen, is this a little dot there on a map? My friends, that's a couple hundred miles of uphill terrain. Uh, four, four and a half years ago, I grabbed a group of friends. We traveled over, and what I wanted to do was to hike a huge stretch of that for like seven days with some buddies just to get a sense of the terrain. I have pictures. Would you, would you, like, to, would you like to see something? Of course you would. Here we go. That, welcome to central Turkey. You leave the coast and you climb and you climb and you climb up into the mountains. This is the route that Paul and Barnabas take. This next image is just a picture of my son, Andrew and I, and we started that morning in that valley and this was midday and we had a long route to go. There are certain sections of that trip where you encounter this, 2,000 year old Roman roads still intact hugging hillsides. And so you're walking along this trail and you're going, no, really, it was probably right here 
that Paul and Barnabas came through this gap. But in this week, we just began to touch one or different segments of one stretch of that journey. And so just as you watch this map, just re, re, <laughs> respect the miles. Paul and his buddy Barnabas, they got hundreds of miles together. They have traveled together. They have served together. They have prayed together. They have suffered together. And back to the map, they hit Antioch. They go to Iconium. They go to Lystra. They go to Derby, And they are so close to home. And instead of traveling home, they reverse and they go back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to Antioch, down to Perga, where what happened in Perga? Where John Mark had bailed on them? And then they sail for home. Why do they reverse their route and go back? Because they are absolutely convinced that this baby group of Christians that these little communities of Jesus followers, that their faith will not be solidified and strengthened and the roots go deep simply because of one encounter. So they double back and they hit it all again. So when Paul says to Barnabas, what are the words? Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, four words, what are they? Let us go back and see how those believers are doing, how those communities are surviving. Are they under persecution? Are they threatened? Have the groups dried up and died? Are they thriving? Are they struggling? Barnabas, buddy, the dynamic duo, let's get it back on the road. Let's go back and see how they're doing. Welcome. Welcome to the challenge of interpersonal conflict. Barnabas says, I think that's a great idea. I'll let John Mark know we're ready to take off again. And Paul goes, what, what, what? <laughs> we're not taking him. Barnabas, I think we should. Paul said, you gotta be kidding me. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Paul, he's unreliable. Barnabas, I believe he deserves a second chance and I believe he's matured. He's not going with us. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. They're not even out of town yet. And there's this major conflict over who should even go on this trip. Acts chapter 15, verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia, that's where Perga was, and had not continued with them in the work. He's going. No, he's not. Yes, he, now listen, Paul and Barnabas are mature people. They should be able to iron this out, and they couldn't, and they didn't. You read these tragic words in verse 29. They had such a sharp disagreement that they what? They parted company. The band breaks up over this question, over this issue, over this conflict. When it says they parted company, what happens here is that Barnabas heads down to Cyprus with John Mark. Paul uh, recruits a new sidekick, a guy by the name of Silas, and heads around this way. And so Barnabas heads one direction, Paul heads another direction, the, the challenge of interpersonal conflict. And this happens, and it's painful. Now, this conflict didn't stay broken. They reconciled some time, maybe years later. Uh, in the correspondence you find in the New Testament of your Bible, both in Colossians chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul mentions John Mark as a dear co-worker. So something got mended along the way. It didn't stay broken, but baby, it was broken. And this happens. And my goal, my goal isn't to have a conversation right now about how to avoid interpersonal conflict or even how to mend interpersonal conflict, but it's just to recognize interpersonal conflict. They're going out, they get engaged, they set a date, and then they get unengaged. And one of those individuals feels abandoned, deserted, maybe betrayed, and more than a little heartbroken. Listen, listen. When you love, you put your heart at risk. 
Christian business partnerships sometimes break up over temperament issues or strategic issues, often between mature believers. A new church is gonna start and they've gathered this core group that's gonna be responsible for launching this new ministry and it's in someone's family room and they strategize together and they plan together and they pray together and they set the date on the map when they will have their first service and then comes that breakfast where someone says, well, I'm imagining the church will be this. Another person says, we're imagining the church will be this and it can't be both this and not this at the same time. Opening day comes, and there are a couple families that are not there. And this just is just painful. Some of you are responsible for a position of leadership in a nonprofit organization. And it's not uncommon to sometimes find a coworker or a board member that was your greatest fan that overcome over time becomes your greatest critic say, thank you very much, Jeff. I find this neither hopeful nor helpful. It's helpful in this respect. Looking back at the story and seeing that this conflict made it into the Bible. They didn't sweep it under the carpet. They didn't ignore it. Hey, what happened to Barnabas? Well, it's just, it's an argument that they couldn't work their way through and the band breaks up. Just seeing that this is in the Bible allows you to go, I'm not alone. Can you say those three words with me? Ready? I'm not alone. One more time. I'm not alone. And you're not alone. I just want you to notice one small thing. They're still moving. Neither Paul or Barnabas over this agreement, they do not zone out, they do not numb out, and they do not check out. They're still active in people's lives. And listen, that's one of the challenges, isn't it? How to get your heart hurt, how to get roughed up a little, and to stay in the journey. Because to love is to put yourself at risk. They're still moving. It's one of the challenges of the journey. It's the challenge of conflict. So Barnabas and John Mark, they go one direction down to the island of Cyprus. Paul, with his new sidekick, remember the dude's name? Silas, Paul and Silas, they head up around the corner of the Mediterranean, and you go, yes, awesome, finally now they're out of town. New cities, new towns, new people, new sights, new sounds, no. The second journey begins with Paul going back to places that he's already been. Remember the four words that launched the journey. Let us, let us go back. Ah, this is challenge number two. Challenge number two is the challenge of repetition. Can you uh, play along? Can you just say that with me? The challenge of repetition, ready? The challenge of repetition. This journey does not begin by going to new places. This journey begins by going to old places. I think that's worth talking about. Acts chapter 16, verse one. Paul came to uh, Derbe and then to Lystra. Hey, and in Lystra, there was a disciple named Timothy. He lived there. And now Timothy's mom was Jewish and she was a believer and whose father was Greek and apparently uh, not a believer. So uh, uh, this uh, Timothy uh, is from parentage that is uh, kind of like ethnically uh, a mixed Jewish mom, a Greek dad. And so this is what happens with Timothy. Check this out. The believers at Lystra and at where? At Iconium spoke well of him. Dude, keep your eye on this guy, Timothy. He is rocketing. He is showing promise. We see Timothy as a great emerging leader. We are so thankful to have him in our church, in our Jesus community, and Paul says, wonderful, I'm taking him with me. And now the duet of Paul and Silas turns into a trio of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and Timothy will be with Paul, first mentored and then serving Paul for years, sent on different assignments. But I just want you to notice, it's back to Derby, back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to Antioch. See, this I think is key. We call it the second missionary journey, but it doesn't start out as the second missionary journey. It starts out as the first follow-up trip. 
They will go to new cities and new places, but it doesn't start out with new cities, new people, new sights, new sounds. It starts out by going back to places that he had already been. And I personally think this is challenging. And I think it's really challenging in our culture. Because we, my friends, are part of a culture that is allergic to boredom and addicted to things that are new. I just want to drop the bomb right out of the gate as we talk about repetition, and it is this. If everything has to be new and interesting all the time, you will miss out on your greatest opportunity for impact and influence. If everything's got to be new all the time, you will miss out on your greatest opportunity for impact and influence. Two words here that came to my mind in thinking about this. One is excitement and one is effectiveness. If your goal in life is to have everything exciting, then just grab for the next new thing all the time. However, if your goal in life is to have a level of interpersonal effectiveness, if you want to be not simply someone who's excited, doing interesting things, but have effectiveness in life, often this will require you not simply to go to new places and experience new things, but often to go back to old things again and again and again. Let me give you an example. Uh, Last week, major, major event, uh, two weeks ago, major event two weeks ago, Uh, Wednesday night, two weeks ago, there was a leadership event for the volunteer leaders in a ministry at Ada Bible Church. We call it Lifeline, but it's basically our middle school and high school ministries. And we run this student ministry at all four campuses. So when you gather all of the volunteers, most of them that lead small groups, from all our campuses, This is what you got in the volunteer meeting. That's not a youth meeting. That's the volunteer meeting. 180 volunteers gathered from four campuses. So here we go. Last week, I contacted Alina, who is on Lifeline staff, kind of uh, leads our small group branch of the ministry there. And I asked Alina what percentage of them were new and what percentage of them were veterans. How many of those people sitting at our East Paris campus for the kickoff leader meeting, how many of them are brand new and how many of them are veterans? She said about 25% new, 75%. This is not their first year. They're back. They're back. Having done another year. And then I asked the question, all right, Lena, based on your experience, yeah, now that's where the action is. (laughs) It's not the leader meeting. It's when a young woman is guiding a group of sixth graders or a dude is guiding, you know, a group of sophomore guys. I said, when does a leader usually hit stride? And Alita said, sometimes in year two, more often in year three. It's when a leader hits stride. Now, just not week three, Year three, see, in life impact, often when it comes to getting oriented, finding out what the responsibility is, and getting good at it, my friends, this simply takes time. If you want life to be constantly exciting, then seek new things. If you want to be effective, it's often going back to an old thing. Here we go. It doesn't have to be new to be good. It doesn't have to be new to be good. I did some math last week that I found a little traumatic. Uh, I, I speak 30-some weekends a year from this platform at our Cascade campus. 30-some weekends a year, um, three services. So some are in the neighborhood of 100-ish messages from this platform. 100 times a year up these stairs to speak. This July, we will have been in our Cascade building for 20 years. 20 years in the Cascade building, three services for most of that time. I'm going like 2,000 times up those stairs to open the scriptures and teach. And if someone said, do you still find it interesting? I would go, yes, Interesting because it's a new message. Interesting because there's new people. Interesting because it's a new series. 
but not interesting in the never done this before interesting. And so this is, this is look, this is my, because talking about, you know, uh, excitement and effectiveness, my goal is to be effective in life. And as far as what I've discerned right now, This is one of the places where I experience some of the greatest life effectiveness. So in a sense, do you find it interesting? Well, that's beside the point because it doesn't have to be new to be good. It doesn't have to be new to be good. Sometimes we find our greatest alley of effectiveness in climbing the same stairs again and again and again and again. And by that, I don't mean preaching. By that, I mean parenting. And the stairs you're climbing is to read one more bedtime story and to tuck that critter in one more time. Critter, monster. I've got a monster. Critter. Critter's better. It's softer. Uh, And I just know, parents, listen. After a while, you can feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. You know, what do you do Monday? We, you know, grade school kids, we get them up, we get them dressed, we get them fed, we send them off to school. Really, what's a Tuesday look like? We get them up, we get them dressed, we get them fed, and we send them off to school. Really, a Wednesday. Be quiet already. Listen, master the mundane. There is something that is good and stable and right in repetition. Do interesting stuff around the edges, but at the core. And then we go back, and then we go back, and then we go back. This has become the prayer for myself. Rather than looking for new tasks, begin asking for strength for tasks that are not new. Instead of constantly being on the lookout for the new and the novel, ask for strength for old tasks. There we go. Ask God to strengthen you for old tasks. One more week, one more month, one more year with a child that you are raising. And please remember, you're not raising children, you're raising adults. You're raising potentially future parents of adults. Ask God for strength for the old. Hey, uh, just before we move on, those of you who are teachers in our schools, For some of you, it's like you're 10, you're 12, you're 14. May our gracious God give you strength for the journey. May he give you new strength for old tasks. Those of you who are parents and just want to be steady and faithful, may God give you new strength for old tasks. For those of you who are nurses, how many thousands of patients have you seen? Those of you who are physicians, May God give you new strength for old tasks. Those of you who are veteran volunteers and you just give yourself without pay again and again and again, may our gracious God give you new strength for old tasks. It's strength for the journey. It's strength for the journey. But repetition is a challenge. It's the problem of repetition, but maybe it's also the power of repetition. That section ends with this verse, 16.5, where it just says, so the churches, these Jesus communities, were strengthened in faith, and they grew, they grew daily in numbers. It seems that in these towns, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, after this visit, for many of these places, it's Paul's third time there because of the reverse trip on journey number one. Something is locking in, And there is an element of life where people on the outside of the Jesus community are saying, how can I be part of that? How can I be part of that? How can I give my life to the one who gave his life for you? How can I be part of that? They grew in their faith, strengthened in their faith, and grew daily in numbers. It's a beautiful picture. It's the problem of repetition, but my friends, it's the power of repetition. But now finally, there at Antioch, And they get to go someplace new. And I think Paul wants to head to Ephesus. I think Paul, Ephesus is the gem. Ephesus is the trade center along the, what's at the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. Ephesus is the fourth largest city in the Roman world. Ephesus has a massive harbor. All the roads lead inland toward Ephesus, toward toward the uh, sea, toward Ephesus. Man, you start a thriving Jesus community in Ephesus. This is a big deal. And it could be catalytic for the entire region. Ephesus is in the Roman province of Asia. 
it's, it's not the continent of Asia. We're not talking China or Japan here. It, it is the Roman province called Asia. And so they finally leave Antioch, and Paul desires to head, I believe, to Ephesus, and we find these words. Paul and his companions, uh, 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 Silas and Timothy, traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, where Ephesus was. God said no. God said no. Well, where do we head next? They're not sure. Welcome to challenge number three. Challenge number three is the challenge of uncertainty. Challenge number three is the challenge of uncertainty. Well, let's go back to the map and let's reroute. Well, we, the Holy Spirit apparently says no, no to the province of Asia. Well, let's go up here toward Bithynia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. How did that happen? I have no clue. But the Holy Spirit says no here. It says the Spirit of Jesus, which I think is the same thing, says no here. And so they hit roadblock number one. They reroute roadblock number two, and they end right up here at Troas. And I don't think they know what to do next. Welcome. Welcome to the challenge of uncertainty. And that's exactly where some of you are today. The challenge of uncertainty. I don't think they know what to do next. Welcome to Troas. The challenge of uncertainty. Good news. As a college student, good news, you now know what your major isn't. After organic chemistry, you know that you won't be a doctor now. <laughs> this is what's called negative guidance. Two friends are gonna stay in Grand Rapids for the next year. They're renting a house together. They're gonna split the rent, just affordable if they split the rent. Then one of them says, hey, I'm gonna move back to Minneapolis, leaving another one. I know I can't pay this on my own. Well, who's your roommate? I don't know. Welcome to Troas. The adoption, paperwork and payments, paperwork and payments, paperwork and payments, and then it starts to slow down, and then it starts to bog down, and then you begin to realize we don't know we don't know if this kid is ever going to be ours. Welcome to the challenge of uncertainty. You'll read in the end of the text in Luke chapter 16 that Paul falls asleep and he has a vision. And in a vision, there's a man standing that is pleading with Paul and the team, come over to Macedonia and help us. You've got to help us. Come over here and help us. And they wake up the next day and go, well, I guess we're headed to Macedonia. You're going, how do I get me one of those visions? I'll tell you, I don't know. <laughs> but just know that sometimes a season of confusion and uncertainty is followed by a season of clarity. Weather the uncertainty persevere in the uncertainty. They take off from Troas. They land here in the port of Neapolis. It looks like this today. It's called Kavala, Greece, but they landed right there in that port. Philippi is 10 miles away, and they will hoof it from that port up to Philippi, which is where we find the team next week. But it took a mountain of challenges just to get to this point. These are challenges that they weathered and they persevered just to really get to the jumping off point of what we would call the second journey. Now, amazing things are going to happen in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. But there will also be continued challenges huge challenges along the way. And I just wonder how many of you would say, dude, that Troas thing, man, that's where we are right now. This season of uncertainty, that's where we are right now. And sometimes you're thrown into this space and sometimes you don't choose it. I remember when I got the phone call. I remember where I was when I got the phone call. So on Cascade Road, had just gone through past the intersection where East Paris is, where you, you cross the freeway in that weird intersection, the freeway there on Cascade Road. My phone rings. It's my daughter. It's my wife's birthday. That's how I remember what day it was. She was expecting, had gone in for a 
routine ultrasound. I say, hey, how you doing? And I could hear the quiver in her voice the moment the conversation started. Ultrasound tech leaves the room, pulls in a doctor. They start identifying a heart issue. They pull Sarah and Matt, who were living in Chicago at the time, out of the ultrasound room into a little conference room and began to read them a catalog of things that might go wrong. Of the things that might go wrong, they had identified a heart issue, which is often connected with Down syndrome. So that day, my daughter calls me. It was almost four years ago. Says, don't, it's mom's birthday. I don't want to ruin her birthday. Please don't tell mom today. Tell mom tomorrow. So I went home and told my wife. (laughs) Because you would rather be in trouble with your daughter than with your wife. (laughs) Just saying, that's for free today. (laughs) And there was a heart issue. And our beautiful, delightful granddaughter does have Down syndrome. And it has been a journey. Required open heart surgery at four months old, three or four multi-week ICU stays in her first 13 months which sent Chris or Chris and I to Chicago over and over and over. That was our year. Uh, Hazel's now three and a half. Okay, I'm sorry. I got to show you the crew. Uh, That's them today. Now listen, what I'm saying is this. We're on a good journey. We're on a good journey with good pictures. It just happens to be a journey with some very challenging spaces. We are on a journey with some great pictures. But it has been a roller coaster. It's possible to be on a journey that's a good journey. It's possible to find yourself in a good story and to feel just kind of surrounded by God's presence and God's goodness and God's favor and yet to have some very miserable days along the way. Journeys can be complicated and confusing. Even when they are journeys that God is blessing and showing himself present. And so just as we begin this six-week conversation together, my one blessing in prayer is this, and it is simple. May you find strength for the journey. May you find strength for the journey when you're passing through seasons of agonizing and painful interpersonal conflict. May our gracious God give you strength for the journey. May you find strength for the journey when you are in nauseating repetition and then you do it again and then you do it again and then you do it again if it is a good thing and an effective thing you are about. May God give you strength for the journey. May God give you strength for the journey when you feel absolutely lost and uncertain about whatever is next. Often, 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 seasons of clarity interrupt that confusion. May may our gracious Lord give you strength for the journey. And so I ask that our gracious God would meet us in this space this week, that he would carry us through our week, that he would give give us the wisdom we need, the courage we need, and the strength that we need for the next mile. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We'll see you next week.